All right, guys, Revolver Ocelot here, and I am your wrestling reviewer, heavyweight champion on YouTube, although I feel like I've probably lost about now, considering that my NXT TakeOver Philadelphia review is a week late, and I do apologize for that. But, you know, I've got the belt. No one else is getting the belt, so if you want it, come and take it. Anyway, guys, I do apologize. This will be my NXT TakeOver Philadelphia review. I know it's going up a week late. I only literally just now watched the final match that I needed to watch. And um, um, I do apologise, like, so, like, in terms of remembering stuff from other matches, I'll probably be, I'll try my very hardest to remember everything. I do apologise again for this going up late, I don't mean it to, um, I've just had a busy week, uh, as I'm drinking out of a, a coffee cup. Fanta is in this cup. Because why not? Anyway, NXT TakeOver Philadelphia, of course, was the night for the Royal Rumble. And um, I guess we'll just kick off with the show. The show opened with the NXT Tag Team Titles match. Well, actually, it didn't. It opened with Paul Heyman introducing us to Philadelphia. It was a nice little callback to his ECW days. It's cool, whatever. We'd get a couple of ECW chants throughout the night, obviously. Um, but anyway, so we kicked off the show with the NXT Tag Team Titles match. It would be the Authors of Pain, Aikam Razar, against uh, the Undisputed Errors, Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly. Um, so this match was basically about O'Reilly and Fish being the small men. Small baby, small heels, sorry, against the Office of Pain, who were the big guys, obviously. And what they did was really smart, because basically O'Reilly and Fish took out Aikam's leg, and they'd work on the leg. They'd throw kicks towards it, a couple of knee bars in there, focusing on the leg of Aikam. And I thought, this is going to lead to a finish, and that's very, very good. And it did, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, just great, like, really, really good heel stuff from, like, O'Reilly and Fish. They are such a fantastic little tag team. They're not calling them the Red Dragon yet, they're just calling them the Undisputed Era, which is fine for now, but, um, I'd like them to be called Red Dragon. They did hit, I believe they hit, um, they didn't hit Chasing the Dragon, obviously, Aikam and Razor are huge, but I think they, they did hit Total Elimination, well, half of Total Elimination at one point, uh, with Fish doing the, the, like, the spinning elbow smash thing. That's it. Um, that wasn't enough. In the end, the Office of Pain would fight back. They would go for a super collider, and basically they would collide. Oh, no, wait. I think, um, I'm trying to remember how they got to get to do the super collider. But anyway, so they went for the super collider. They hit it, but Akam's leg gave out, so he went into the turnbuckle, and Fish got out, and he pushed Akam into Rizal. Rizal was knocked out of the ring. Fish hooks, um, schoolboys. Acom, one, two, three, the Undisputed Era retain. And there's a fantastic scene at the end of this match that I may make my thumbnail for this video where uh, Fish and O'Reilly are out of the ring on the mat after the match and they're just dead. They are motionless. And I love that because it just seemed like the heels had just got away with it. And I really, really appreciate that. that. Uh, in the end, three and a half stars. This was a very good match, a very good opener. And um, the Office of Pain, you know, they surprised me. Because they were always in good tag matches, and I get that they're working with Fish and O'Reilly, or DIY, or The Revival, or Sanity. But, they're always there, and they're always doing their job well. So if they go to the main roster, I would not be that sad. Second match on the show, it was Velveteen Dream against Cassie Sono. This had very little build, but they gave it build. In a pre-match interview, Velveteen Dream talked about how he would knock Ono out in 30 seconds. And I was... Quite glued to the screen at this point because I wanted to see how they'd do this. Basically, you know, Ono was, was you know, he's kind of cocky, to be honest. But Velveteen Dream came out and he was going for Ono and he actually caught him with, like, the best hook ever. He knocks Ono out and as opposed to pinning him, which I really, really like because he is still kind of a cocky heel, kind of a cocky tweener, really. Um... Instead of pinning him, he went in, he said, ref, do a 10 count, do a 10 count. And he was like, like it was, he, uh, Ono basically, Dream was really cocky and he was parading around like he'd pretty much already won. And Ono got up and just gave him the best, like, forearm ever. And it was just perfect. And I would have really loved it if Ono had maybe just been like, ref, count him. Like, this is a nice little story bit there. But they got a story in this match out of nothing. And I really appreciate that. And I think the Velveteen Dream has had two takeover matches now. They've both been enjoyable. So well done, Velveteen Dream. Um, as, as opposed to like everything else that happened in this matchup, Velveteen Dream hit like a cartwheel Death Valley driver 
using like as a rebound oh no so basically obo ran off the ropes and velveteen dream caught him and gave him that cartwheel death valley driver which is honestly one of the coolest looking moves in the company um oh no would fight back with a series of forearms he he went for one to dream to the back of the head which obviously dream moved and got the uh, cartwheel death valley driver he would finally get the ripcord elbow though and dream kicked out which was a huge shock um, he had nothing left to do, basically, but out of nowhere, Dream caught him with the cartwheel Death Valley Driver again. This was after he'd also hit that that kind of Sister Abigail DDT, which he gave to Black at War Games. That looked amazing. It didn't look as good as it did to Black, but it still looked cool. Um, so anyway, in the end, Ono didn't know what to do. Dream hit him with another cartwheel Death Valley Driver, but he, like, powered him up and he looked absolutely cool. Hit him with that, went up top, hit the purple Rainmaker elbow drop. One, two, three, Velveteen Dream wins, and Cassis Ono loses at TakeOver again. But I think Velveteen Dream probably needed the win. I like I like both, but I think Dream's got more longevity, and I think that he's a lot more over with the crowd, and Ono can get wins on NXT to kind of build him up because he's got more of a, a heritage because he is, you know, quite, a, you know, he's, he's older, he's got more of a background. So Dream kind of did need this win. In the end... Pretty good little matchup here. Three and a quarter stars. They got a lot out of nothing, to be honest, because this had no build, and I think they did very well. And three and a quarter stars might not seem that high, but, like, that's a pretty good match. And I give kudos to both men. Velveteen Dream is 23 years old. Or 22, actually. That is amazing. Kudos to Velveteen Dream. Ah. Third match on the show, and it was probably the weakest matchup, but it wasn't bad. It was Shayna Baszler against Ember Moon for the women's title. And this basically, this match all revolved around Ember Moon's arm. Because obviously Baszler would do the stomp that she did to Dakota Kai, kind of injuring the arm of Ember Moon. And Ember Moon would sell it for the rest of the match. Now, she, I think she oversold it, which was kind of the problem. She sold it like she broke it, which didn't make it as believable when she was in an arm bar for like 10, like a minute nearly. Um... But she did still sell it well. It was just kind of a bit oversold at points. Um, she would do a couple of cool things. Springboard crossbody. She'd hit the Eclipse, which was kind of cool. Um, but obviously, the injured arm, she couldn't get the cover. Out of nothing, Basil would lock her in an arm bar and keep rolling through, which I really appreciate because this showed Basil's MMA background and the fact she is a great submission wrestler, which we know she is because her MMA career, she's about, I think she's 15 and 11 in her MMA career, which is a, it's good. Good. It's a positive win ratio. And she'd keep getting this arm bar in. She'd keep going through and rolling through and rolling through. But in the end, she'd roll through and then Ru uh, Ember Moon would stack her up and kind of put herself on top of uh, Baszler's legs. One, two, three. Ember Moon would somehow retain. Um, at points, of course, like like right at the beginning, Baszler would try the Kirifuda driver, which is the, um, or the Kirifuda lock, which is the, um, the rear naked choke. But um, she would obviously never get it until... After the matchup, where Baszler would attack Moon and lock it in the Kirifuda lock. So, are we getting that again? Or are we getting Kyrie in... Um, where is it? Where is it we are for Mania? Is it New Orleans? New Orleans. Um, yeah, it is, it, is, it is Orleans, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in the end, this matchup, three stars. It was good. I liked... The, the, the MMA stuff from Baszler. I think she's great still. I think Moon's great as well. I just think that the overselling kind of took me out of the, my realm of believability and the illusion that this was an actual fight kind of kind of dipped a bit for me. But three stars, though. Still a good matchup. Uh, next, we had the match. I literally just finished. the ex uh, It was Extreme Rules. The Extreme Rules match between Alistair Black and Adam Cole. Um, I knew kind of what this would be in a good way and but i do appreciate that this wasn't just hit each other with a weapons match like i appreciate that all they did was not just hit each other with weapons they had a story there they had basically it was cole trying to win to escape black and it was black trying to get his revenge and i appreciate that because when you know cole had black down he'd get really cocky and you know and then black would catch him or something and the crowd had popped for that the crowd popped for tables and chairs and all that sort of stuff and, you know, there was some really wacky, not wacky, but, like, kind of cool spots that were kind of weird. Like, at one point, they brought a ladder in the ring, and, oh, no, something's come up on my laptop. Uh, I'm just going to tell it to go away. Um, and at one point, basically, what would happen would be, um, 
Oh my god, no. Oh, we are good though. Yeah, we are good, we are good, we are good. Sorry, sorry, I'm just checking. Um, so, basically, Cole was in an electric chair above Black, and then Black would basically throw Cole into a ladder in the corner, and Cole would end up back first. I thought that was really wacky, but it was still cool. Uh, two tables were set up on the outside of the ring, and um, Alistair Black went up top to give Cole a double foot stomp as Cole's head was in a chair. Cole got up, he threw the chair at Black. Black caught the chair, but would then have the chair super kicked into his face. Black would fall, then fall off the top through the two tables. I thought that was a really cool spot, but I don't know, it's it a bit wacky at the same time. Because it was creative, because it kind of diverted my expectation, because I thought Black would catch the chair and then just throw it back. But no, he didn't, so touche, you kind of caught me off guard. Um, there was a really, really cool spot early on, where um, Black went for a cabrada after dropping a kendo stick. He went for a cabrada, and Cole caught him in midair with a kendo stick shot, which was risky. Um, but I guess we move on, and we move on to the most risky spots of the whole match. Oh my god, I can't even describe it, but Cole set up two chairs with the seats facing each other like that. And he was going to give him the, the Ushigoroshi, basically, the, the AA onto the, onto the chairs. And he basically decided that I'm not going to do that, I'm going to have the backs facing each other. So the point was up like that and the chairs were like that. And I thought, they're not going to do this. This is stupid. Someone's going to die. Like, spines aren't meant to hit objects like that. And Cole went to do it. And I was like, oh yeah, Black escapes. And then Black picked him up and gave him the fireman's carry AA onto the point of those chairs. Oh. My. God. That scared me to death. I literally jumped out of my seat watching that today. I... There were obscenities. There was cursing. I just gotta say... Fucking hell. Jesus. Um... Look. It was a smart spot for the story. Because it was like the hero getting his revenge. But... Never do that again. Because that was scary. And there's two parts in the body which I don't mind you working over and using in, in dangerous spots. Well, no, there's two parts of the body I don't like being used in dangerous spots. One's the spine and one's the head or the neck. This was the spine and Adam Cole could have been paralysed from this. So that kind of killed the match a little bit. It was a great spot, like, honestly, for the story, I was like, great. But I couldn't get over the fact that, honestly, it was very dangerous. Um, after that, uh, Black would um, go for a cover on Cole, and basically the Undisputed Era, uh, Fish and O'Reilly would come out, and they'd take out Cole, uh, they'd take out Black, and they were going to put him through an announce table. But then Sanity, all three members of them, Alexander Wolf is back, would come out, and they would they took out... Um, Fish and O'Reilly, Dane came, uh, gave a tope suicida to all four men, which was kind of cool. Um, Black and Cole were on the announce table. Well, no, they were on a box near the announce table, and Black kicked Cole off so he'd be sitting on the announce table, then gave him a jumping meteora off that box through the announce table. That was kind of cool. He rolled Cole in the ring. Cole gave him super kick as he was getting in. Cole picked up a chair, and Black gave him Black Mass out of nowhere for the one, two, three. This went like 22 minutes. He got a lot more time than I thought it would. And it was still great. Like, it was a great matchup. I appreciate it tremendously. And um, it was great. I'm going to give it four stars, though. I can't give it four and a quarter. I just I just can't give it four and a quarter. It just, just for that one second I was taken out of the match. I just, mm, not a fan. But four stars, though, great. Yeah, and you should watch it, because it was great. And then the main event happened and just before the main event i am going to say that there were a couple of sightings on this show so we saw war machine raymond rowe and hansen we saw trevor man which is ricochet and then we saw ec3 who actually was called ec3 and not Derek bateman which i found very interesting because the carter part of his name refers to dixie carter the former president of impact wrestling so I don't know what they're going to do there, but then anyway, those three guys, those guys are all now in NXT. I imagine War Machine will probably get the tag title shot in New Orleans. I imagine EC3 and Ricochet may debut there, or Ricochet may just go main roster or go cruiserweights, whatever. 
Anyway, main event time, and we had Johnny Gargano against Andrade Cien Armas. Which Gargano shirt on today. Um, this match was insane. You all know this match was insane. Dave Meltzer has told you this match was insane by giving it five stars. And I don't think it'd even do me just the match justice if I sat here and told you everything that happened. Because this match was pure class. This match was... It defied my expectations of what these two could do. And um, Johnny Gargano is quickly <laughs> becoming not just one of my favourite uh, wrestlers at the minute, but one of my favourite wrestlers of all time. He is the best babyface in wrestling at the minute. Nobody touches him. It's just his, his small stature and his believability and his facial expressions and his body language that makes him the best babyface in wrestling. And I guess I've got to go over some of the moves in the matchup. So right at the beginning of the matchup, they did some chain wrestling and both men went for their respective finishes, the Gargano escape and the, the La Sombra, the El Idolo. Um, and Andrade actually also, I should mention this, had a cool entrance. He had the only special entrance really on the show. He had a mariachi band, a mariachi band, sorry, play into the ring. And he wore his La Sombra mask, which was cool. And also, uh, Zelina Vega paid tribute to Lita with the red outfit, which... That was a, a tribute to Lita, if you didn't know. Um, so yeah, at the beginning, they chain wrestled. They tried to hit their finishes early. Um, and then it just got insane. Like, they just... I can't even describe how amazing this match was. You know, like, Andrade gave him a double foot stomp on the apron. And Gargano, you know, he hit super kicks out of nowhere. And there was this great spot probably like halfway through, where they both clothesline each other and neither of them moved. And then they both slapped each other and both of them went down. And Gargano was getting killed throughout this matchup. And there was a point where Almas was just picking up and slapping him. And Gargano would get up and he'd punch um, Andrade, but he'd go down to a knee. And he'd get up and he'd punch Andrade and go down to a knee. And he'd just hit like super kicks out of nothing. And it'd be amazing. There was a great spot where Andrade... He'd, he'd hit like his big, you know, reverse DDT out the corner. He hit that double foot stomp on the apron. And, oh my God, like, just, he went for something. And then Gargano went for a super kick out of nowhere. And, Garg uh, and Andrade put his arms up. And Gargano would then super kick him in the knee. Um, he super kicked him in the knee. And then he um, super kicked him in the head. And that was crazy he then went for the gargano escape and got it and somehow some way almost would escape that um at one point um gargano went for the this the um super kick and i think uh, zelina would grab his leg and then um gargano took the double knees in the corner and he took another set of double knees in the corner as well um gargano was on the apron at one point actually and zelina gave him a hurricane rana into the steps gargano uh, would be pulled in the ring by almas almas gave him the La sombra one two kick out by Almas, and that was insane. Um, go, uh, at this point, Almas didn't know what to do, so he put uh, Gargano on the apron. He went for El Idolo on the apron, and out of nothing, Gargano did like the springboard slingshot DDT on the apron. Almas died, um, and then Zelina like came round and was going to get Gargano, but Candice LeRae jumped the barricade and took out Zelina, and she ran off. We got back in the ring and those two men just, they just, they just, I can't even describe this match. Like, it might be one of my favourite matches I've ever seen. Like, it just, I've rewatched it and I just can't find any fault. Like, I just can't find any fault with anything they did. Okay, so when Gargano went for the Gargano escape... He, um, they kind, they nearly botched it, but they saved it. That's the only fault I can really find. Towards the end of the matchup, Gargano and Almas would be standing on the apron after Almas got his leg on the ropes after a Gargano escape. And Gargano would be pushed by Almas into the post. He would then take the double knees into the post, and Gargano was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then Almas gave him the drape in La Sombra, the draping DDT La Sombra off the top rope and would pin Al uh, Gargano. One, two, three. Almas retains, but Gargano looks like a million pounds. Like, he looks unbelievable. And 
this is like five star match. Like when I watched this matchup, I was like, there's no question this is a five star match. This isn't four and three quarter. This isn't four and a half. This isn't five and a quarter. I don't do that. This is five stars. Go and watch it because it honestly took my breath away and it just, I can't even talk about it that much. Like I can tell you all these sparks of things that happened, but you've just got to watch it. Like you've just got to watch it. Five stars, best match of the year so far. And I've watched Wrestle Kingdom and it was better than that Jericho Omega match, I think. And I think that's, that's tremendous credit. And I'm not just saying it because it's a WWE match because I'm not one of those people. New Japan had the best match in, the comp in, in wrestling last year. And the year before. So far this year, Gargano and Almas have uh, stolen the show. And even Dave Meltzer thinks so. So That was NXT TakeOver Philadelphia. In rating the show, it's hard because the undercard were like all good, but if there was one more great match, I'd be able to give the show an 8.5. But the last two matches on the show, the great Extreme Rules match, that was, you know, it had some questionable spots, but it was great still. And then the main event that just didn't put a foot wrong. I'm going to give the show an 8 out of 10. It's a very good show. It's definitely worth watching. Was it better than the Rumble? Absolutely. NXT knock it out of the park again. And uh, that is how you... Uh, that is literally... That's NXT Philadelphia, guys. So thanks for watching. This has been Roll Slot. Like, comment, subscribe for more. Tell me your thoughts. What did you think to Almas and Gargano? Do you think it was five stars? What do you think to Extreme Wars match? What do you think to that spot I mentioned? Do you think it was a bit risky? What do you think to the women's match? What do you think to the fact that there was no title changes on this show? And what do you think we're getting in New Orleans on the NXT show? Thanks for watching, guys. This has been Revolver Rosselot.